this was one I think we were all kind of holding our breath and plugging our noses and not quite sure what to expect. It had been a couple of really tough quarters. Uh, you and I had the chance to talk to Pat Gelsinger, um, ask him some questions. I've shared my sentiments on Twitter. You can see those in the show notes. I won't repeat it because I'll probably get it wrong given the time of day. But um, so the long and short, much, much, much improved performance this quarter. Um, after two year, two some consecutive quarters of losses, the company actually got back to, to profit. Um, not by a lot. It was 13 cents adjusted against three cents expected. And they beat on revenue at uh, 12.9 versus 12.13. Um, before anyone calls me out on this, because I've already had to have this debate on Twitter and on LinkedIn and everywhere else I posted, yes, there were some things done on the adjusted side to EBITDA that made the number bigger. Every company does that, though. So just if you're going to go after Intel, you do really need to start scrutinizing every adjusted earnings report the same way because they had some things written down. There's some things done with depreciation. There's some things where they change amortization. People, companies do this to hit their numbers. There's Numbers are not always hit on the top end. They're sometimes hit on the bottom, on the back, and the corner. And adjusted EBITDA is one of the gifts to CFOs, uh, is one of the biggest gifts to CFOs on the planet because it gives a lot of flexibility for how revenue is recognized, when it's billed, where it's invoiced. You know, now we're going to start making judgments about people because something it's, uh, you know, people are packing the channels at the end of quarters or, or Apple shipping lots of units into their stores, right, to hit certain numbers. I digress, but I just felt that was good to say because I had a bunch of people come after me for claiming it was, this was a better quarter. Like in every way, this was a better quarter. Now, let's be fair still down year over year but that that was also expected we're in the middle of what's still considered to be a pretty strong gully for devices they showed some robustness and i believe pat can you nod for me if i'm right that they actually said they reclaimed some share in notebooks okay and that's after what's been quite a run of seeding share so that should be seen as a positive thing um servers numbers are still pretty tough uh, but the company has seen a really, really significant uptick in its book and its opportunities around Gaudi and around its AI accelerators, which, by the way, had they not said that, I'd be very concerned um, right now. The company has also saw one of the best quarters it had seen in a, quite a long time for its foundry business. Um, I need to spend a little more time in that to figure out exactly what's driving, but it uh, you know, in our conversation with Pat, he did talk about, you know, shortening time to, to site, time cycles to revenue with packaging, um, as well as probably the biggest thing of note, at least for me, Pat, was he was very confident in reiterating the five and four. Now, given the operational woes that the company has had over the past several years, is there a more important thing for Intel than getting the five and four done and getting it done as close to on schedule as possible while preserving market share, preserving uh, customers, while preserving um, reputation, and of course, margin. You know, that's the fourth thing. And that's probably one of the biggest no-nos on Intel's uh, overall number has been its, um, its margin has eroded like immensely. I mean, wasn't it in the 50s about six to eight quarters ago? And now it's sitting in the high 30s. And so that margin uh, erosion has definitely worked against the company. But Pat, this was the first time on a earnings that I actually saw the stock move like meaningfully. It it was up a few dollars and um, it seemed that this might have broken the log jam. So my prediction as I turn it over to you is um, this last quarter was the bottom. This is the start of a slow but encouraging turnaround for the company. Yeah, it was really awesome talking to Pat Gelsinger for a few minutes. It was 5 a.m. in in Seoul. And um, yeah, it seems like it was a week ago, but it was maybe a day and a half ago. So I think it's important. So first of all, I think it's uh, two things are important. I think um, it's important for people to understand the continuum of AI. Listen, the frothy PCI Express cards for training and systems is frothy as frothy as crazy nutty. 
and everybody likes to talk about NVIDIA. The reality is, is that AI is a workload, right? And it's, it's spread across everything from PCs to the carrier edge to the data center to the hyperscaler cloud and, and, and everything in between. Just by the way, like we have with machine learning today in a, in a $5 SOC or in an FPGA that, that, that you get a year's battery life out of, <clears throat> it's a continuum. And although it's not as simple to, to, to look at Intel and say, oh, the number of PCI Express cards, they're not GA on their GPU-based card yet. They are with Havana, and they are set up with AWS, and I am intrigued about some of the judo moves that the company is, is, is making out there. The other thing, and we don't talk about this, is still today... Uh, more AI workloads are inferred on CPUs than they are on GPUs or accelerators. Um, but I know it's not as sexy, so people don't talk about it. But I do believe that Intel, it will absolutely and is actively participating in in this lift of, of AI. I mean, every uh, one of the latest DGX systems from NVIDIA uh, comes with the latest uh, SOC Sapphire Rapids uh, from Intel. So I think that it's important for people to look at this holistically, even though it's not as simple or as frothy. Here's the other thing. When, when you're a company in Intel's position that has had a pretty severe degradation of financials and had years of problems getting their fabs uh, act together, it's sometimes easy to forget about all the pluses uh, that are going on. By the way, the first time I ever talked to Pat G when he came back and he was talking about five nodes in four years, I put that as the most important thing the company can do. And, and people were like, you're crazy. It's about the design. And the design is important, but if you can't actually get the design and manufacture it effectively and on time, you're going to lose. At a minimum, if if you have an amazing process, you can fab anybody's uh, product. Uh, ironically, so uh, prior to CEO prior uh, BK, that was his mantra that said, "We don't always have to have the best designs. You're going to have to fab everything in our fabs." Well. He took a two-year lead and turned into a a, a three-year uh, catch-up, and and Pat and company is is cleaning up the mess right now. But it's easy when you get in this position to shield it from the great stuff that that is 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 going on. Uh, Sapphire Rapids took a long time to get out. It's one of the most sophisticated chips that I've seen in a long time, primarily given all the accelerators. Oh, and by the way, it was the first chiplet. Uh, based architecture uh, that Intel did. Um, now we're going into, you know, heavy duty Meteor Lake, right? Where uh, the company is integrating uh, more AI. They already have AI in there uh, via ABX 512, but really leveraging some of these fixed function uh, AI controllers to get to tops level to be able to drive. Uh, the new versions of Windows and the new applications that are coming out to, uh, to take advantage of that. Pat, Pat, what's the first line, the first bullet point in in Intel? It was, yes, we are on track for five nodes uh, in, in four years. So, listen, I've always said 85 nodes in four years, they're going to make the big comeback. Uh, I like that the company was really conservative on on how it, it positioned it, but you know again I think I think it's it's easy to look at their issues and not look at the things they have accomplished to get them where they need to be uh, in the next two years. Oh, all right. So maybe a little audio there, but you know what? If you didn't hear it. 
Pat basically reiterated that he's right. He's smart and that's consistent. In all joking though, I mean, look, you 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 called the shot, you got the shot right, and that deserves some attention. But the other thing is the company does. And I like that you called out the accelerators on the CPU, Pat, because people keep forgetting that. And P Pat did reiterate that to us. It's not all about AI on the GPU. There's a lot of acceleration that's gonna be done, not on, G on GPUs. There's gonna be a lot of things well, done on ASICs, a lot of things what's done the, on- Yeah, FPGAs. I mean, what's the, ex what's the accelerator inside of uh, an A100? It's a tensor core. A tensor core is an ASIC, right? So it's kind of funny, like, you know, and even in their GPUs, they do the same thing. You know, one thing we we didn't talk about was an, uh, the win, the Ericsson 18 Angstrom win, okay, uh, for IFS. I mean, here's another thing I called. I, it hasn't come true yet, but I believe that once IFS shows that it can deliver bleeding edge and leading edge. The U.S. is going to move from military, has to be done in the United States, which is called the RAMP program. Right now it's RAMP C to all of critical infrastructure, which China did um, 20 years ago uh, to, to U.S. tech manufacturers. Ericsson, right, world leader uh, in carrier equipment, uh, signed up for 18 Angstrom to do to do ASICs and uh, SOCs there. So big win. Eh, nobody's talking about it. 